afternoon, everybody, depending uh, which part of the world you're in. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in and welcome to the 2022 um, uh, FD Day. As you heard, it's the 37th FD Day, has been going on for 37 years. Um, and as you, as you remember, it's the second Sunday uh, of June when the FD community always uh, meets to, to celebrate another year. Now, um, I, I also miss a little bit, although uh, these um, online FD days have, um, have, have increased the amount of people that can participate, I think we all miss a little bit the face-to-face -face, uh, connection. And to, today we have, at least for the FD team, we are all together here at the, at the center. So without much ado, I want to start uh, by telling you the, the statistics and um, a little bit of the um, new um, treatments. Can I, can I share the screen now? Yes, thank you. So, um, so first you're gonna hear me with a little bit of the, can I move this? Yes, so you are, this one is the one on, right? So as I told you, I'm going to tell you the statistics and then the new treatment updates. Then you will hear um, Dr. Gonzalez Duarte to talk about some clinical care update. And then uh, Patricio Millar will review non-pharmacologic treatment. Zinit Khan will tell you about COVID. And Kaya Dalamo, our, our, our other nurse practitioner, will... Uh, tell you a little bit about a new crisis scale. And after that, as you heard, we'll have a Q&A uh, period and we will mix this time basic science and uh, clinicians. So we will have Francis and Sue together also with all the clinicians, including Batel Bar from Israel and Lila Raju, uh, who's a cornea specialist. So. Let me start, as I've been doing for 15 years, with the statistics, with the population statistics. Well, there were no... Am I... The, you're seeing the thing? Okay. So, um, this year there were no... From 21 to 22, there were no new births. Is the, is the first time there's no new birth. But there were two newly diagnosed girls in Mexico. Uh, one 12 years old and one 14 years old. Uh, we had not been identified before. There are altogether 310 patients with FD living worthwhile, uh, worldwide. So this, this little graph shows the distribution of the patients. As you see, almost 199 patients are younger than 25 years old, and 211 are older than 25 years old. The oldest patient is 64, the youngest is 4, as you see here, and then the graph here shows each age, which is described here in the horizontal axis, each age and uh, the number of patients at each age. You see at age 13, there are 15 patients. Um, age 24, there are 16. Age 30, there are 19 and so on. There are slightly more um, females, um, more females than males. 54% are females and 46% are males. Now, patients are distributed throughout the world from uh, North America, Canada and the US, and South America, Brazil and Argentina, to Europe, uh, including Austria, France, uh, Germany, Belgium, UK, and Israel, and uh, Australia. Now, let me see, is this moving? One uh, thing I want to tell you and emphasize, and you can see in the research booklet, that there's a new center of excellence for FD in Mexico, uh, led by Dr. Maru um, Godinez, and so that's 
that's big news and you can read about it in the uh, research booklet. Uh, Dr. Vicenio will be, or Dr. Godinez will be uh, with us. She's, she's here in New York and will be uh, seven months with us thanks to the support of the foundation and then she will continue directing the new center in Mexico. I want to tell you, and there were some questions from the audience, that our our statistics are, are good. There is better survival. What this of the population, what this slide shows is a Kaplan-Meier curve uh, of survival. What you see in the horizontal axis is the age of the of the population and the percent survival in the vertical axis. So as you can see, the survival for patients born in the last two decades has increased significantly. And today, 85% of uh, patients with FD survive into adulthood, uh, a percentage much higher than in previous decades. Uh, each of these lines represent the survival in a specific period, as you see, 1950 from 70, 60 to 80, 1980 to 99, and the last in red is the survival in the last 20 years. So these, these statistics are encouraging, and we think that the, the advantage or the reason for, for these good results is the fact that if the clinical care and basic research are closely connected, we now have four centers around the world of excellence that see patients where patients are treated. And there, the information is centralized, as you know, in a database with all the centers having access. And patients consent to give biological samples, either blood or uh, skin or, or uh, Thesis, and that is used by basic scientists to study a number of things. One interesting uh, or very interesting study supported by NIH and led uh, by, by Francis Lefcourt in Montana was the study of the gut microbiome in, in patients with FD. You'll see there are very interesting results there. Uh, Francis is going to mention that, but you can also read that in the research booklet. We are also using um, blood samples to study, other, to study other genes that are affected in, in FD. And again, there's a new program studying the connection with, or the potential connection with Hirschsprung disease, which is a disease that affects the, the nervous system in the gut and has a lot of similarities with FD and that Dr. Chatterjee here at NYU will be studying. There are also two um, interesting projects in making FD uh, stem cells from, um, from, from fibroblasts, one in Israel and one in the US. And again, you can read about that and the usefulness of stem cells in the uh, research booklet. Now, there are also FD models, animal models, and the a uh, useful thing is that new drugs that are developed can be tested in these FD mice models that were developed by uh, basic scientists, by Sue and Elisabetta and Francis and a whole dedicated team. And then the drugs can be tried first in these animal models and then they can be translated and uh, tested in clinical trials in patients. So what are our advantages are the, the clinical database with 50 years of medical history of 700 patients, the personalized treatment by, by a dedicated clinical team, that close collaboration I was mentioning, and the fact that we have animal models for new therapeutic agents and the possibility of doing clinical trials. So what about new drug treatments, which is, I. I'm, I'm sure what everybody wants to hear. So I will briefly tell you what's new and in the pipeline. As you're aware, there are two types of drugs. The symptomatic drugs, and those target symptoms or treatments, and they meaning things that you feel, and they are supposed to make you feel better right away. Now, the second type 
of treatments are disease modifying treatments. Those target the cause rather than the symptoms, and they may prevent or reverse the worsening. But they is important to remember that they may not make you feel immediately better. In fact, they may even have side effects until they can do what they can do. So we are working on both types of treatments at the center. So in terms of symptomatic treatment, we are focusing on what we call breakthrough autonomic crisis. There are, there are a number of patients that um, even without a trigger, an infectious or other type of trigger, may have repeated or recurrent autonomic crises that appear to be emotional, or at least there is no uh, obvious uh, trigger for that. So for, for those, we, we, we want to use dexmetomidine now, or, or Presidex. You, you, are, you are aware that dexmetomidine has been used for autonomic crises, has, has been a game changer, and many of you may have experienced the, the quickness with which the symptoms are relieved. Now, the problem is that although there is rapid relief, you have to be in the hospital for this to happen, and you must be in the ICU because the treatment is intravenous. Now, we now have um, a new formulation of Presidex or dexmetomidine, which is a sublingual film. So um, we think we can do this at home, we can try this at home, and uh, to do this, we'll, we'll do a clinical trial where you will have the, the medication and um, if you develop, when and if you develop a, an autonomic crisis, you, you will contact the center, a decision will be made, uh, whether a, a clinician will guide you from there, and a decision will be made whether you take the sublingual film, and you will be monitored. All this time, you will be monitored. Um, the study will have a number of innovations, all that again at home, uh, like an Apple Watch and a number of other um, uh, gadgets that will measure not only the blood pressure and the heart rate, but a few other things. And most importantly, there will be a scale that you will be feeling together with the clinicians to assess the severity of the crisis. And Kaya will briefly, Kaya Dalamo, the, uh, will briefly um, tell you a little bit about that scale today. And of course, you, you will be uh, told more about that. So this trial will start soon, will be at home, and we hope it will be a significant, uh, will provide significant benefit to patients. Now, what about disease modifying treatments, right? The ones we are most um, urgent to, to try to do. Well, you, you're all aware that FD is, a, is due to a genetic mutation. Right now, genes, as as you know, are the blueprints um, to make the body's protein. Proteins are, are large molecules that um, do do that has a, have a lot of clinical roles in the body. There are a lot of proteins, up to four hundred thousand. Now, in FD, there is a mutation. There is a uh, a, a mistake in the blueprint of just one protein the is called elongator protein one or elp one the gene that makes this protein has a mutation and the specific defect is in something called splicing uh, so there is misplicing for this protein you've heard sue um, explaining these many times and before because of that misplicing the amount of LP1 protein that is produced in the body in people with FD is low, is, is very low, um, to the point that some neurons during development, during embryogenesis, actually don't even develop. 
and at birth they they are they they haven't appeared normally now that is a difficult time to to intervene however during life some neurons that did develop they do get sick over time and we believe we have strong um evidence experimental and some clinical evidence suggesting that the um during life the progressive visual loss and the imbalance that people with fd suffer is due to the lack or the low levels of this protein in different tissues so how can we intervene with patients how can we modify this well we know as i mentioned that without treatment this there is progressive visual loss and progressive imbalance. We think that if we increase so, the amount of the protein by correcting the splicing defect that's in the genetic mutation, we believe that the increase in protein will be uh, that by fixing that gene will, will produce more protein and will be able to preserve vision and balance. So what, what is the evidence? Well, we know that ELP1 rescue the phenotype in mice. This is a scientific way of saying that if you fix the genetic defect during uh, fetal development, the, the phenotype is rescue and mice that were going to die will not die. Uh, Francis can also show that the more help one can, can potentially save retinal cells in the eye. And there is also new data from Sue's lab showing that mice treated by increasing help one, by fixing the defect, can actually walk better. So this is not proven in humans yet, and that's why we need a clinical trial. And how can we do those trials? Well, you've been listening about this for quite a while. So I'm, I'm going to review with you very briefly where we are today. We have three ways of uh, three complementary approaches where we can fix the genetic defect and increase the amount of L1 protein. The simplest one is an appeal that is a small molecule is um, derived from uh, kinetin, a compound that corrects splicing, something that was um, reported by Sue in 2004, 18 years ago, is a splicing enhancer, and you will hear more uh, about that today. That initial compound was um, there was a lot of development in 10 years, and I'll show you something in a second. And that uh, compound that initially was just a proof of concept now is 10,000 times more uh, potent and more efficient in increasing the, the protein, it has not been tried in humans yet. We hope that's going to be soon. Uh, Sue will tell you a little more about that. The second way which you have heard uh, that can correct the splicing defect and increase protein is with a synthetic drug called ASO or antisense oligonucleotide. These antisense are synthetic drugs similar to RNA, but a little snippet. They bind to the um, RNA and temporarily fix the problem repair the sort of reprogram the cell and allows more of the normal protein to be made. Now, ASOs, these same type of compounds, were uh, used by Adrian Craner, a scientist working at, um, at uh, Cold Spring Harbor. He designed one of these compounds to uh, fix spinal muscular atrophy and other genetic disease also due to a low protein. Well, he was very successful with that. Uh, that has changed the, the prognosis and he's trying to repeat the same success. He designed another ASO that also corrects 
splicing defect, um, the, the compound has to be given every four months, is given or, um, inside the spinal uh, cord, in the, in the spinal fluid around the cord. And the important thing here, and I'll show you a little more, is that there's a foundation called N. Lorem Foundation. This foundation uh, is funded by the um, developers of the drug for SMA, and they have taken the commitment to develop the um, this this ASO for familial dysautonomia to be tried in one patient, and currently the toxicology is is being finished, and we hope that uh, by the end of the year or earlier we'll be able to test this in the first patient. Now the third way to fix this compound is using a viral vector. Now, the, the vector, the viral vector is like the transport. The, the gene, the normal gene, is uh, put inside the virus, the, the normal L1 gene. That virus is injected to the body, either through the blood or directly in the eye or in the spinal fluid, that infects the cell and corrects the installs the new gene that is transported by the virus and corrects the defects. Um, Francis, and I'll show you something in a second, Francis, and um, the team has shown that this can be done in the eye. So for any of these compounds in the clinical trials, what we will do is monitor vision and monitor walking, meaning the imbalance and the ability to see to determine if the drug is effective. So going back, and uh, Sue will show you a little more of this, this is the, shows the optimization that that initial compound that derived of kinetin went through in the last 10 years, first with NIH and then uh, al always with Massachusetts General under Sue's direction. And you see that the that, that initial compound is now 10,000 times more, more potent. In terms of the ASO that I was telling you, this shows the structure of the ASO that Adrian Craner developed for uh, spinal muscular atrophy. It's called SpinRASA and is approved. The one he developed for FD is very similar structurally, and we ho also hope to try it. And finally, I have a very simple cartoon to remind you the, this thing that, you know, it's still for, for many of you and even for us sound like science fiction, and is the idea that you put a normal gene inside the virus uh, the virus acts like a transport, is taken by the cell, and then the new genetic material is incorporated in that cell and essentially cures the defect. Um, in, in terms of the retina, the idea of gene therapy is to put it directly in the eye, to inject it directly in the eye, so it could work here in the retina with a normal copy of the um, gene. So in, in summary, we have a robust uh, clinical research platform. We are combining clinical and basic research, and we have new therapies in the pipeline that are about to enter uh, clinical trials. So we, we think there are, there are good reasons to be very uh, optimistic, and um, we, we hope to, to be able to achieve all these goals we, we have um, uh, um, set ourselves up. So you will have opportunity to ask questions about these treatments in the Q&A. And of course, you will have the actual uh, basic scientists that develop this to ask a lot of the questions. And if you want to know more, there is um, a new research booklet that um, you are all able to download already that describes many of the things I told you in, in detail. And again, I'll be happy to answer any questions you 
may have. So thank you very much. And now I want to introduce our next uh, speaker, the new uh, co-director. You know, until yesterday, she was the associate director. Now she's the co-director of the uh, center, Dr. Alejandra Gonzalez Duarte. We are happy to have her. And um, Alejandra, take it away. Thank you. So uh, for those of you that do not have the, that I have not had yet the fortune of meeting, I am the co-director of the Envayulis Autonomia Center. However, I met some of you 16 years ago during my fellowship at NYU with Dr. Kaffa. I can't tell you how happy I am to be back at the center. Let's start talking about our current population. Our most powerful tool is our FD database. It keeps track of all the information of FD patients in real time. As you heard from Dr. Kaufman, we have now 310 active patients. The majority of them are in between 16 and um, into 22, 24 and 44 years old. This implies that patients are not only living longer, but we are now seeing more patients with non-FD medical age-related illnesses, such as gout, osteoporosis, and type 2 diabetes. For this aging population, our screening protocols are continually being updated. We are in constant communication with the FD community and care partners. So let's have a look at where those calls originate. We get calls from the emergency departments, from the ICU, from the medical providers, other facilities like rehab and home calls. These calls all come on a daily basis and almost half of the families live in the US whereas the rest remain international. I do want to emphasize the importance of working early with the local medical teams because they are our boots on the ground. As a result of the pandemic, annual visits have been split into virtual and office visits. We have 49 in-person annual visits and 74 virtual telemedicine visits last year, around more than 143 visits total. Almost half of, of these visits, um, at least 20 visits, were from patients who had been lost for follow-up who has now established care after not being seen for many years because it was too difficult to travel to the center. We are happy to welcome those 20 patients back. We also receive over 100 telemedicine consultations per year. Infections such as cellulitis, osteomyelitis, or dental abscesses were the most common causes followed by COVID infection disease and its complications. We are using our telehealth kits and home use medical devices to take critical measurements that we need to assess people for medical problems at their homes. Now, let me tell you about hospitalizations. We had 563 days at the hospital of patients that were admitted either in a pediatric or a medical ICU. At any given day, we have one or two patients that are monitored daily by our center. Um, the most common causes of admission were the autonomic crisis and its complications, particularly aspiration pneumonia and electrolyte imbalance that resulted in altered mental status or acute kidney injury. It's important to remind us the importance of being careful while the patients are eating and also to be current in the CPR protocols. In the center, we observe around 80 surgical procedures, ranging from major procedures such as spinal fusion to difficult twist extractions, RG tube repairs. Colonoscopies and bron bronchoscopies were also common procedures. We also discussed the advantages and disadvantages of three organ transplants with surgical specialist teams. In eight of the individuals, there were seizures or movement disorders of new onset. Surprisingly, in one case, this was provoked by an antibiotic and it was resolved when we discontinued the treatment. Also, two patients showed involuntary movements that were associated to the COVID-19 infection. 
and the movement which appeared gradually. Thank you for your interest in learning more about what, uh, the work that we do at the center. In the next minutes, Dr. Patricia Millard, a member of our FD clinical team, will remind you of the non-pharmacologic strategies that can be helpful in FD crisis management. And he will also ask you, which ones are you using more frequently? Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thank you very much, Alejandra. Uh, so let's see. Uh, whenever we have a patient visiting the center or whenever somebody calls, Besides medications, we always try to give non-pharmacological uh, interventions that may also help alleviate their symptoms. So I want to take this opportunity to review some of this with you. And we also want to hear what works from you. So we're gonna be pulling up some polls in between the slides so you can share with us this information. Uh, let me remind you that you can mark several options from each question. And if there's something that you don't find on the screen, feel feel free to write that up in the Q&A section so we can learn as well. Uh, if you're curious about how any of these uh, techniques, maneuvers, or, or interventions may work, uh, please ask about that in the Q&A section and we'll be very glad to, dis to discuss that with you. So whenever a patient has an autonomic crisis, we always try to look for a trigger for that. Uh, we always try to look for injuries, uh, infections, and sometimes these can be provoked by, by emotions, either negative emotions like anxiety or getting too excited about something. So when a patient has an autonomic crisis, we know that the medications work, but they may take some time to start acting. So there are certain maneuvers that people with FD can make that can help alleviate the unpleasant feelings brought on by the crisis or even help avoid them altogether. So, oh, this went too fast and too low. Here we go. So besides taking medications, uh, what helps with your crisis? Let, let us know in the poll. Some people do uh, guided breathing exercises, uh, meditation, like doing guided imagery meditation, um, trying to get distracted by watching a show or listening to music. And some people tell us that sneezing helps uh, end their crisis as well. If there's anything else that you don't see here in the poll, uh, you can always write in the Q&A box and we'll be happy to learn from that. Okay, let's see. People are still voting that. This is very helpful. I love this. A lot of people like uh, watching shows and listening to music. I want to hear, I want to hear later what's your favorite song. There's a, a, lot, a lot of people that benefit from sneezing. That's fantastic. And we have some breathing and meditation. Okay, I think that's that's almost everybody who answered. Thank you very much. Here we go. Here are the, the results, so you can see. And we're also going to be collecting the results from this survey, and we're going to be posting them in the blog as well. We want you to learn. Maybe there's something, one of these techniques that you didn't know. Maybe it helps you. And at the same time, we want to help to, to learn what works from you, and we can share it with everybody as well. Okay, so... Moving on, <clears throat> another very frequent problem that people with FD have is that when they stand up, their blood pressure goes down. And if this gets severe enough, they start getting dizzy, lightheaded, may lead to fainting, and this makes it very difficult to walk, get around, and do your daily activities. This can get particularly worse during warm weather if you're not very well hydrated or if you're losing fluid. And the fastest way to, to lose fluid is when people have diarrhea, which is a very common problem. So when your blood pressure is down, do you use any of these techniques, like adding extra salt to your food or feeds, um, getting extra fluid boluses? Some people uh, tell us that when they are chewing uh, on something, this helps bring their blood pressure up. And of course, that laying down is the fastest way to bring your blood pressure back up. And while you're still voting on the pulse, let me remind you that if you're awake and you're laying down and your blood pressure is still very low, that can be a very big red flag that either you are very dehydrated or there's a very bad infection going on. So you, could, you should call your uncle center and, and let us know how you're feeling. So let's see, people are still voting here. A lot of people respond to fluid boluses. Let's see how it's going. Lying down is a very big one. Let's get a few more seconds to give everybody a chance to answer the poll. And again, you can mark more than one option. If there's something here that you do works for you and you don't see, 
write it in the Q&A box and I will you'll be glad to review those later. Okay, it seems like everybody finished choosing their questions. Oh, here we go. A lot of people, most people benefit from the fluid boluses and from laying down. There's a few people that benefit from chewing. This can increase your bladder pressure while you're masticating, although it's short-lived and it will only uh, continue to happen while you're still chewing. But it may be something that if you eat by mouth, may be helpful. And adding salt, of course, to your meals can help bring the blood pressure back up by increasing the fluid absorption. So finally, uh, when people with FD get sick or they get admitted to the hospital, laying in bed for a long time, it can make your lung function get worse. So actively moving the air in and out of your lungs it can help keep your lungs uh, healthy. So uh, whenever you're in these situations, do you do any of the following to help keep your lungs healthy? Uh, participating, in, participating in physical therapy and getting out of, the, of, out of bed is one of the best ways to do this, but we understand that if you're sick or if you're in a hospital, it may not be possible for you or permitted to do that. Uh, singing, getting the air out of your lungs. I know a lot of you like singing. Uh, I'm very good at singing, but only in the shower for some reason. Uh, muse, participating in music therapy. Again, doing breathing exercises, getting your in and out, uh, blowing bubbles or blowing pinwheels for the younger patients. And again, if there's anything else that you learn that you do and you'd like to share with us, just write it away in the Q&A box. Okay, so we're seeing people are still voting and sharing the results. A lot of people try to participate in physical therapy, get out of bed. Breathing exercises seem to be very helpful. Well, some people seeing blowing bubbles or pinwheels that's also there so let's see i think everybody's done with this pause so you can see the results and again we're going to be posting these results in the blog and uh if we see more things that work for you you will we'll let you know if you have any questions about how 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 is the mechanism about how these uh these interventions these maneuvers helping you let us know in the q a section and we'll be very glad to discuss that with you as well Okay, so up next, Kaya Dalamo, one of our fantastic nurse practitioners, is going to be talking about an autonomic crisis rating scale, which will let us help, would, would, would hopefully help us know how severe crises are and how well they are responding to treatment. Okay, thank you for your time, and uh, Kaya, you take it away. All right, hello, my name is Kaya. I'd love to take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit more about that autonomic crisis symptom assessment scale. So why is the use of a scale important? Because we know that crisis is very complicated sometimes, the causes are countless, and that every patient is different. And with every patient presenting a little differently, we recognize that although there's a cluster of signs that often come together, not all have to be present every time, and they also vary from person to person and even from time to time. They typically include high blood pressure, fast heartbeat, skin flushing, blotching, sweating, a display of severe distress, and uncontrolled nausea, retching, and vomiting. This wide presentation creates a lot of difficulty in capturing all of the signs and then tracking them to resolution. And granted, the signs and symptoms can also be from other causes, which is equally important to find out. So access can help reveal that too, like when all other signs and symptoms are stopped, but nausea continues. In that case, perhaps there's another cause of nausea that caused the crisis and needs to be determined. So access can be used as a gauge. It allows very clear pre and post drug assessment and helps to clarify if certain medications are helpful or not in which ways that they're helpful and to help assess their safety, as you can see what the exact response is concerning decrease in blood pressure and heart rate, and also possible dangerous adverse effects of certain medications that can decrease breathing and oxygen saturation. So, Oh, one. There we go. So here's the scale. It might look like a lot at first glance, but it's very simple. You start by recording the date and time of start of the crisis at the top, and then you move down straight through the first column like this. You record the medication being given, the blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen level, temperature. I froze. 
skin signs, sweating, degree of nausea, and behavioral changes. So this scale is potentially very useful and you can all receive a copy to start using it now because it's available in the virtual FD Foundation swag bag or resources tablet from FD Day today. So we need your help now to complete it and give it back to us and give us your feedback so that we can fine tune it and make it the very best. Thank you so much for speaking with me or hearing from me today on the access um, scale. And next we'll be hearing from Mrs. Zenith Khan, our fantastic nurse practitioner, who will be talking to you more about COVID-19 outcomes in people with familial dysautonomia. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, hello and shalom everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Zenith Khan and today I will be talking to you about COVID outcomes in people with familial dysautonomia. So COVID has affected all of our lives and today we'll be talking about current recommendations for COVID and FD, our statistics, how people with FD have tolerated vaccines, as well as those who are not vaccinated, how they fared with COVID-19. Lastly, we will advise how to move forward living in year three of the pandemic. So if you test positive for COVID-19, please notify your center right away. We can determine whether you are eligible for treatments to reduce your risk of severe symptoms or hospitalization. These treatments must be administered within five days of onset and are in short supply. If you do not already have a pulse oximeter and blood pressure monitor, please get one as soon as possible for emergencies. We advise each family member to come up with an isolation plan with your family in case either a parent, a caregiver, a sibling, or the patient themselves is sick. And if you are hospitalized in a center other than NYU, please give us a call very early on um, so we can speak with your medical team. If you test positive for COVID-19, the decision to escalate care and treat with antiviral pills such as Paxlovid or monoclonal antibodies is given in a case-by-case -case basis. The antiviral pills, what's important for you to know is that they can only be taken whole by mouth and they cannot be crushed or put through a G-tube. The antibodies, however, are given as an infusion or an injection. Patients who are asymptomatic or experiencing only mild side effects can use home crisis and antipyretic medication. However, those who are showing signs of respiratory distress, persistent crisis, hypertension, um, or blotching may begin antiviral therapy right away. What everyone wants to know and what's really what we've um, gathered is first, FD patients do not appear more susceptible to catching the virus as occurs in other diseases that have severe immunosuppression. FD patients' immune system can fight the COVID-19 virus. We've had several cases of entire families being infected with COVID, but the only family member that had FD did not contract the virus. That being said, FD patients do have an increased risk of system systemic complications compared to the general population. Through the natural history study, the NYU Dysautonomia Center is tracking COVID cases in the US, in North America, and all over the world, and in Israel. 43 cases of COVID were reported, 20 patients in the US and 23 in Israel. Sadly, one patient died in Israel prior to vaccination availability because of myocarditis, and this is very unfortunate. 14% of FD population um, contracted COVID-19 compared to 58% of Americans. In, in terms of how our patients fared with COVID, we had a 98% survival rate from COVID, Baruch Hashem. Patients in North America and Israel had similar rates in terms of how many tested positive. In North America, 25% of FD patients required ICU admission, 25% were treated in the ED and then discharged home, and 50% were treated at home with mild to moderate symptoms. All patients that were vaccinated had a good prognosis. Severe COVID and complications that we've seen. So as we've seen in the general population, the most severe complications occurred in patients that were unvaccinated. Those severe complications were most likely to involve the lungs, the need for mechanical ventilatory support, 
and affect muscles due to generalized inflammation. Just like other illnesses, COVID-19 infections can trigger autonomic crisis. Some patients took a long time to regain their strength and had not completely returned to their prior health status. Another notable observation was that FD patients could be reinfected with new COVID strains that emerged as the virus mutated in the community. COVID-19 vaccines are the most effective treatment at preventing you from severe illness, hospitalizations, and death. Almost all patients tolerated the COVID-19 vaccination with, and boosters with only mild side effects um, with both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. We had one patient who received the AstraZeneca vaccine who reported some ankle swelling in their feet after getting the vaccine. The most common side effects that we saw were malaise, headaches, muscle pain, fever, autonomic crisis. And because of that, we recommend patients to take around the clock Tylenol or ibuprofen in the absence of kidney disease for two to three days following vaccination. All patients who adhered to this regimen tolerated their vaccines with little to no side effects. And patients who were not adherent to this regimen um, did, support, did report more autonomic crisis and two patients had to be hospitalized for treatment of autonomic crisis. Something that's really important to note is that immunity is not absolute and it's not permanent. We urge all FD patients, their families, their caregivers, their teachers, anyone who's around your loved one to stay up to date with the latest booster to ensure lasting protection. Now that we're living in year three of the pandemic, we really advise for patients to not miss or delay doctors, PT, OT, speech, dentist, or rehab appointments. We want everyone to stay up to date with vaccines and boosters, schedule an appointment either in person or virtually with us so we can review your medical history and see how you've been over the past few years. And in terms of at-home social support, um, you know, we encourage everyone to eat and socialize outside if possible, monitor the rates um, and outbreaks in your communities. And if you are attending or hosting a larger gathering, encourage all people to do a home rapid test prior to attendance. Stay connected with us on Instagram, Facebook, or our blog for latest updates on COVID recommendations from our center. And up next, we have What's New at the Dysautonomia Center with Leanne and Mackie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Leanne. I'm a program coordinator and administrative lead here at the Dysautonomia Center. Hi, I'm Mekki. I'm the project assistant here at the center. We're really excited to be a part of FD Day today. We want to share with you a few updates here that we have. Sorry, give us one second. We're just going to wait. Sorry about that. <laughs> First, we've transitioned to a new answering service called Telemed. Telemed sends a text to the on-call provider within five minutes of a patient or caregiver placing a call. They will continue to contact the provider every five minutes until the patient's call is returned. This new system has allowed us to decrease provider response time so that patients and caregivers can get the immediate assistance that they need. We want to thank the FDUK Foundation for their support and collaboration to create a new telehealth kit for families living in the UK. This new kit includes a device called Step.io, which combines a user-friendly platform and a highly sophisticated stethoscope, which allows providers to listen to heart, lung, and bowel sounds in real time during their visit. We know that people with FD have reduced temperature sensation and sweating, but how exactly do we measure these variables? We would like to thank the FD support, the FD Foundation, for their support in acquiring a new TSA2 device. This device objectively measures hot and cold temperature sensation. The device then provides data which can be tracked over time to, man to monitor for any changes. In order to measure the rate of sweating, we've brought back QSART testing. QSART uses electrical stimulation to activate sweat glands. The device then records a quantitative measurement of sweating. 
We know that people with FD have trouble walking, but we need a way to measure this as well. Right now, we have the Mobility Lab, which is a new wearable technology. In the office, patients are connected to six sensors that allow us to quantitatively measure aspects of your gait and balance, including pace, arm swing, and stride length. Our team is excited about these new devices. Information about gait, balance, temperature and sensation, sweating, and small fiber function will contribute to the ongoing natural history study of FD and provide us with objective endpoints that can be used in future clinical trials. All of these devices that we've described today will be incorporated into the evaluation visits here at the center. While telehealth remains an excellent resource for families who are unable to travel to New York City, we do encourage you to schedule a visit to the center when you're able. We look forward to seeing you here.